Thank you, Brother Mike. All right. I don't wear a watch. <laughs> oh, don't worry. Don't worry. My wife will stand up and do this before, uh, before you ever get a chance. When, it's like you're running long. Hi, uh, everyone. Um, my name is Pastor Allen. I'm the drummer. And, uh, and I, uh, my, uh, my prayer, one of my prayers today is that my preaching will be better than my drumming. And uh, I, do, I do okay, but, uh, uh, you know, when I get the opportunity about once a quarter to speak on Sunday morning, I get nervous. I, uh, it's a very weighty thing to me to handle the Word of God and to be here in front of the congregation. This is a sacred assembly. We have set aside uh, everything that all of our leisure and, and pursuits, and you know, I, don't, I won't get into you know, this is not the Sabbath, it's Resurrection Sunday, but we've set aside this time, we've sanctified it unto the Lord, and we put all that stuff away, and we come here to hear the word, and, uh, and once a quarter, uh, I'm, I'm an agent uh, of that, so I'd, uh, it is an honor to be here in front of you all, uh, delivering the word this morning. Uh, how many of you, uh, how many of you have had a burger at Mooney's Burger House? Right? So I'd, I was, uh, along with the rest of you, pretty dismayed to find out that Main Street Social was closing over here and all of the uh, vendors inside uh, were, uh, were moving or relocating or shutting down. It's, uh, it's sad. You know, it's uncertain times. I don't know anything about their books and, and why it didn't work. Uh, you know, Liberty Hill's growing. Other restaurants are opening. But... Uh, I, I want to get, this is connected to the donuts in the fellowship hall. Uh, I stopped by this morning at Grand Donuts to pick up the donuts, which they give us two boxes of donuts and a box of kolaches every Sunday for free. They do not charge us for that. We stop by and pick it up, and in large part, that's to honor uh, our brother, uh, Sid, Sean, who's not here this morning, but is a member of our congregation, and uh, he, he fled the Camp Communist uh, in the Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge and came to this country in 1979, and he's brought probably close to 200 people over to this country to experience freedom and get out from under that regime, and uh, they honor him. They call him uncle in whatever, you know, in the Khmer language. It's a term of endearment, and... Uh, so to honor him, they honor us uh, because Sid loves this church. And uh, anyway, so Grand Donuts. I talked to the owner. They bought Mooney's. They now own Mooney's Burger House in Leander. So, and she, uh, I don't mind taking a, a moment here. I'm not. Uh, I'm not telling you where to eat lunch. <laughs> but. Uh, she gave me, she pulled this out and gave it to me, Grand Reopening, New Owner Management. So I'm really excited for them. This is an existing location in Leander. You'll probably know where it is on 183, but um, one of these Sundays after church, I'll definitely be up there uh, enjoying some wares, but they're training right now and, and getting up to, up to speed as, as the new management. So that's eh, exciting. Um, wow. So getting a, uh, Getting to speak in front of you is uh, it's always a little bit stressful for me. I, I didn't get a chance to not watch the Olympics this week as much as I was not watching it before. Um, so that's, a, that's just a dig at the opening ceremony, which uh, I hope you guys all saw and, and, and got a, a little bit of a rise out of it. Man, it was uh, something else. Pray, pray for, uh, pray for our, our world, our, our culture. The Western society has, uh, has drifted from our, our moors, uh, for sure. So, um, wow, it's humbling to be here. If you walk with God for any length of time, you know that real knowledge, knowledge which is from above, the Bible said, does, does not puff up and give you a big head. Rather, real knowledge lets the wind, takes the air out of the balloon, so, uh, 
I feel less and less worthy every time. I was talking to Mel this morning about when it's time to preach. Uh, the spotlight is on my life, and I just, you know, just feel humbled. So why don't we pray before uh, we get into the Word? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. I thank you for every soul that's here, Lord. As we dig into your Word this morning, as we talk about the atonement of Christ, Lord, let us open our hearts and let us let us see the beauty of our God, the wisdom of our God, and uh, what you have planned for us, Lord God. It, it blows my mind when I think about the depths and the riches and the wisdom uh, of the knowledge of God. Uh, the love that you have for us, Lord, the provision that you made that we could be uh, saved in our uh, fallen state, Lord. It's, uh, you know, every morning we should wake up and uh, just be in awe and uh, have a heart of gratitude. And uh, so, Lord, we want to point uh, all of our attention uh, back to that atonement today, remind ourselves what you've done, and uh, just pray that you would anoint my tongue this morning to uh, deliver your word in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so I have behind me a prop. I always joke about bringing uh, the heresy jar with me when I say something controversial. I'll turn around and drop a dollar in it. Um, times are hard. I only have quarters today, so... Um, but uh, we will be talking about public justice and, uh, and that a little bit. So, All right. I don't really have room for my Bible and all these notes up here. I need a bigger, need a bigger pulpit. There we go. That'll work. So you've, you've written, ever seen that book, Everything I Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten? It's everything you need to know about God you can find in the atonement of Christ. The extent of his power, raising Jesus from the dead, that he has power over life and death, the justice of God, the wisdom of God, the extent of his love, the, the power of his providence and providential government, uh, what his disposition is toward us. Um, it really is uh, just mind-blowing. Romans 11.33 says, Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. And then my, if you want to turn with me to 1 Corinthians 2, 7 through 9. And I, I know uh, Samantha, who normally runs things for us in the sound booth. I don't know if we can put scriptures up there or not. Okay, then uh, you'll just have to read along. But 1 Corinthians chapter 2 give you a moment to boot up your Bibles and, uh, and browse with me to uh, 1 Corinthians. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Oh, you should take some comfort in that, friends. I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Whew, that should be a refreshing verse, no matter what you're going through in life. So if we back up a little bit, big picture, to the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And he created mankind, created Adam, placed him in the garden. Why? What on earth, what, did, what was God missing? Was God somehow incomplete? Was God needy? What was missing before? I mean, does God have an ego so I've heard it many times uh, that the reason God created man was to glorify himself. And I don't know. It seems like he sure got cheated if that was, if that was the, reason, <laughs> the reason behind it. But no, what I believe and, and what I think is consistent with the presentation of the Scripture is that God had an abundant life. He had a full existence bountiful in himself in the Holy Trinity and fellowship and communion within the Trinity of the persons of the Godhead. And he wanted to share 
his wonderful, abundant life with beings who could appreciate it and enjoy it. God created man in his image after his likeness. What does that mean? I believe that it means that the attributes that God has in his infinite existence, he gave to us in some finite measure. Creativity, a will, the ability to originate our own actions, independent of you know, outside influences, we can choose between alternatives presented to us. We have a, a mind, we can think, we can reason, we have, you know, we can imagine, we have a spirit, and God communes with us. Spirit speaks unto spirit, the Bible says. And I don't know the mechanisms of how all that works, uh, but uh, I know that that dimension exists and that we have a spiritual connection with our Heavenly Father. And so God made all that is to put Adam in the midst of it and to explore it, to, I mean, all of science. Science has only flourished in this world in civilizations where Christianity has spread because the worldview that's necessary for science to flourish has to believe that there is a creator and that there is an order, a natural order and principles that operate that are consistent and universal so that you can explore and, and test and, and observe and that there is a coherence to it. You can make sense of it, the intelligible uh, I forget the rational intelligibility of the universe, and I can't remember what the phraseology is that they use. So God was creator, and out of an abundance of love and fullness of, uh, of life and, and experience, he made friends to share his wonderful existence. And God walked with Adam in the cool of the garden. That's another way to say fellowship. They hung out together. They looked at the creation that got all these weird animals, millions of species of animals run, you know, running around. Some, some Adam would never discover because uh, you need a microscope. And, uh, and they're spread far and wide. And he's going around with Adam, and Adam's naming the animals and observing creation. I don't know how long Adam walked around in there before he realized that, you know what? All these animals are, uh, you know, they're reproducing and they're, you know, multiplying and... Uh, I'm alone. And in that existence, Adam and Eve and God, God was also the, the righteous creator and, and governor of this new uh, system, this new relationship. And just to make sure that Adam would let God be God, and man be man, he gave him one tiny law. Do not eat from any other tree, in, or eat, excuse me, eat from any tree in the garden. Do not eat from this tree. He can't give half a law. It's very lenient. God did not require a litany of uh, conformity of in, in all of these different uh, you know, things, he said he gave him one, one restriction and pretty minor and that's where and that's where we join our hero Genesis 3.3 3. let's start reading together now the serpent was more cunning than any animal of the field which the Lord God had made and he said to the woman has God really said you shall not eat from any tree in the garden there he is maximizing the restriction the woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, You certainly will not die. For God knows that on the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you'll become like God, knowing good and evil. Wow. New concepts, new ideas that... Uh, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took some of the fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband with her, and he ate. You know, the devil operates the same way today. 
He maximizes the restrictions of God and makes them seem so onerous and burdensome. And then he minimizes the consequences. He says, you will, you will not surely die. Nobody, nobody has to know. Uh, you're not really hurting anyone. You can always ask forgiveness later. The playbook's not very big, guys, in case you, uh, in case you were wondering. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves waist coverings. Now they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. At least he was honest. And he said, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? Now, is this an, a lesson in omniscience here, that God really didn't know what was going on? No. Clearly, clearly this is God's, God telling Adam, Adam, I've got an explanation coming. It's time to give an account. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me. My kids used to do that all the time. What did you do? Well, he was like, you know, that was like how it started. The woman you gave, that you, the woman you gave me, you did this. She gave me some of the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. And then we go on, and God describes the curses that were upon the earth and upon um, Adam and Eve because of their disobedience. With no... Sometimes, sometimes we ask questions, and I've heard it asked, Why did Adam do that? I mean... As Adam's descendants, you know, we are disconnected from God. Some believe that there's a sinful nature that we inherit. Um, I won't get into all the different doctrines around that, but why Adam? He didn't have a, he wasn't corrupted. He didn't have a sinful nature. So what caused him to make that decision? And I think the, in my mind anyway, what you're asking for is a rational explanation for an irrational act, and there isn't one. So that very question uh, undermines its, itself uh, with a false premise. Adam chose unbelief and disobedience. And by the way, Adam's sin was far, far worse than Eve's, because Eve was deceived. Adam wasn't. And he broke fellowship with the Father, and by his example and headship, brought the curse of sin and separation and the sentence of mortality upon himself and his descendants. Romans 5.12, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all mankind, because all sinned. For until the law, sin sin was in the world, but sin is not counted against anyone when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the violation committed by Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. And it got worse. So Genesis 6, uh, starting in verse 5. This, This, to me, is one of the saddest passages in the whole of Scripture. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord. Let me say that again. And it repented the Lord. Let me say that a third time. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. God had a wonderful design for mankind. The plans that God has for you, God's plan A, is abundance and joy and life. And we live in a fallen world, and so it is a world, it is an environment that is at war with the Creator. 
but we are doing what we can in our small capacity to undo the curse and spread the kingdom of God wherever we go. And eventually, um, that curse and, and much, of the, uh, uh, much of the pain and the circumstances that surround us now will be done away with. It will not always be so, but for the time being in this uh, season, epoch, dispensation, if you will, it's a loaded term, but we exist uh, in a war, in a warfare world that has uh, aligned itself against God. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. And so, uh, in large measure, it has continued until this day, uh, that the world has been under the control of the evil one. Romans 3, I won't uh, won't read it right now, but you all are familiar, there is none that uh, is righteous, no, not one, all have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. Paul is making a case, like an attorney, of the mutual situation of both Jew and Gentile in that passage, and he's convincing them that all are under the sentence of death from their treatment of God and their disobedience to the law of God, and we're all in the same boat. So let me ask you a question. We've got this mess. We've got... Mankind, all of us have been there, disobedient to God, have rejected him. Why does God, or why did God not just forgive? Hmm. Any, uh, anybody want to be brave and venture an answer? Uh, Chuck, I'm going to get you on record. <laughs> God's just just so I'm going to read a few newspaper headlines Um, let's see New York Times October 2023 New York City sees rise in vandalism and graffiti amid decline in property crime arrests Los Angeles Times April 2024 Los Angeles reports increase in car theft as police funding cuts impact enforcement. Chicago Tribune, June 2023. Chicago's crime wave linked to decline in police stops and enforcement. Houston Chronicle, January this year. Houston sees spike in drug-related crimes as prosecution rates fall. So, without getting too political into why we have uh, prosecutors who refuse to do their jobs... Uh, when the law is ignored, it emboldens lawbreakers. See, when God gave the law to Adam, he put sanctions on it. What was the sanction? The day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now, we know that Adam didn't keel over dead you know, physically on that day, but the sentence of mortality for sure was upon him, and uh, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure uh, what I believe about spiritual death, because I think it's very muddy uh, when you start trying to build doctrines around what spiritually dead means, but there is something that happens to us when we sin that is a separation from God, and uh, I'll just stop there. I don't have to end, understand all mysteries as much as I would love to. So what God, a a law without sanctions is mere advice. The Ten Commandments, 
forgiven? Well, there were sanctions attached. The Song of Moses goes into great detail about what will happen to the nation that, you know, well, Israel specifically, but that ignores the law of God and the blessings that will come upon them if they keep the law of God. Those are sanctions. Those are governmental. Sometimes there are natural sanctions that God doesn't have to do anything. When you're stupid, you know, you get the Darwin Award style consequences right away sometimes. And uh, the natural consequences of sin are there, but there are also governmental consequences. And God put sanctions on his law because the law is important. Nothing God does is arbitrary. God's laws are not inventions from, um, from whole cloth from his imagination because he loves to uh, he loves to spoil all of our fun and he loves to hand us lists of do's and don'ts and to do's and do nots no nothing God does is arbitrary Psalm 119 is a the longest chapter in the Bible and it is a love letter from a man of God King David to the Lord about the beauty of his law Nearly every verse in Psalm 119 is a refrigerator magnet of verse on David's heart, on the refrigerator of David's heart, all of those verses. Great peace have they which love thy law, nothing shall offend them. Uh, thy word is a light unto my feet, a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. Um, I have, ex- uh, was I have passed all surpassed all of my teachers uh, because I've uh, kept your law um, just over over and over um, about how amazing and, and wonderful the law of God is and God's law like I said is not arbitrary but God's law is a reflection all right you may have to think about this but God's laws are descriptions of reality right and that reality is inherent in God's being and his essence and in the nature of what he created. Many of the, the moral law of God could not be any other way. Do you think that it was okay for Abraham to worship other gods? I mean, he didn't have the Ten Commandments. Right? That means he can do all kinds of stuff, right? Do you think it was okay for him to lie? For him to commit adultery? Of course not. Those obligations did not arise because God gave the Ten Commandments. They merely defined what our obligations were to God and to each other, what they had always been and what they always will be. God's law is beautiful because he is beautiful. I'm going to read a, I'm going to read a passage here and... Uh, this one has always fascinated me since I read this, but it's Psalm 138, 2. I want you to think about what, you know, about this. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. How exalted and how holy is the word of God. The reason that the psalmist can say that is because the law of God that he's given is a reflection of God. It is a description of who God is. And we learn of his nature and his character through the law. And so when all of us have gone astray like Adam... And we've treated the law of God as an unholy thing, and we've trodden it underfoot, and we've thumbed our nose at God through our sin. And by the way, all sin is toward God. King David uh, lusted after Bathsheba on a rooftop, saw her, and, and committed adultery. And then she got pregnant, and he tried to cover it up by having her husband killed by moving him to the very front line heat of the battle. And after all of that, he wrote in the Psalms, Against thee and thee only have I sinned, O Lord. (laughs) I mean, Bathsheba might have something to say about that, right? I mean, hey, what about me? No, it's because he realized the truth that, I mean, you sin against your brother, your sister. 
They're made in the image of God. How can you love God whom you've not seen if you can't love your brother whom you have seen? And so our interactions with each other horizontally, because the Imago Dei is, is there, the image of God is present in every one of us. And when you dishonor and, and uh, sin against your brothers, you are sinning against God. And so David understood that. So God can't just forgive because he would embolden all of the lawbreakers. He would be saying that it's not that big a deal when you break my law. You can break it with impunity. And I can just set aside the penalty and, and uh, we all just go on, right? Let's just forget, you know, forgive and forget. Let's, uh, let's all just move on. Well, what that would create is a world in, of absolute hell and chaos where fallen angels and fallen men uh, just do what they want. Some of them want to serve God. You know, that's great um, until they break into your house, you know, or until the guy breaks into your house. And it's, uh, we can't just uh, live and let live either because God is the ruler of the whole universe. God is the creator and the ruler of all mankind. So what God might want to do as a loving father, he can't as the ruler of of the universe because it would be doing a disservice to his exalted law. So I'd like to give you an object lesson. Uh, I heard this story 35-ish years ago and didn't, you know, I loved, I loved the analogy. I never forgot it. It stuck with me, but I thought it was just, um, I thought it was a made-up story. So many years later, I found out there was a ruler, um, a lawgiver in a Italian uh, city uh, called Lo- Locris, I think. Um, Locri. Named Zeleucus. Have any of you ever heard of Zeleucus? Okay, my wife has heard of Zeleucus. Okay. Well, good, good. This will be this will be a this will be a great uh, a great object lesson here. And uh, the Roman uh, historian compiled uh, a bunch of anecdotes uh, in like thir- around 30 AD, um, probably during the life of Christ uh, on earth, um, and included this uh, excerpt of a, of a real live uh, ruler um, in, the, in the Greek Empire in southern Italy called Zeleucus. Now, I was actually a little surprised to find this seemed odd to me and so I did some reading up on ancient law because I've always thought you know within Christendom we honor marriage and we honor fidelity and that other cultures are just hedons you know hedonistic uh, you know they're just I kind of just dismissed you know them as uh, well you know they don't they don't have any standards they don't have the right standard you know the one standard uh, but it couldn't be farther from the truth. Even in the, you've heard of the Code of Hammurabi in Babylon. They had a, a law that if a married woman had sex with a man other than her husband, that man would be executed through drowning. Under ancient Egyptian law, a man in that situation would be flogged with a thousand blows with a rod. No wonder Joseph got out of there so fast. You can have God after him and... And probably be beaten to death, right? So, I mean, but we, you know, sometimes we don't think about, um, you know, some of these. Now, sometimes their punishments were brutal, right? Um, and they may not have, they may not have allowed for mercy uh, as God the Father did when uh, in Deuteronomy. But so Zeleucus was a ruler of the city of, of Locri, and he was actually the giver of the laws of that city. One of the reasons we, he was elevated to his post is they had uh, some rampant crime and uh, some civil disorder and chaos. And he came, he came to the elders of the city and said, I can provide you with laws that will quell this unrest and help you get things back under control. And they were given to me by Athena in a dream, he said. And they... Uh, they said, okay, and so they adopted these laws, and one of, and these laws uh, that he gave them 
they were in force without much disruption for over 200 years. And one of, one of the things that I thought was amazing is they, uh, they had a, uh, I'll read to you from uh, Demosthenes about that. He, he says, um, in that country, the people are so strongly of opinion that it is right to observe old established laws to preserve the institutions of their forefathers and never to legislate for the gratif- gratification of whims or for a compromise with transgression, that if a man wishes to propose a new law, he legislates with a halter around his neck. If the law is accepted as good and beneficial, the, pro- the proposer departs with his life, but if not, the halter is drawn tight and he is a dead man. So, I don't know, I'm not saying I want to propose this today in our Congress, but if you propose a law and it's... Uh, it's to the benefit of uh, some special interest group and not to, uh, you know, the general, promote the general welfare um, or outside of the, God help them, outside of the enumerated powers of the Constitution, <laughs> then uh, strangu- death by strangulation. I don't know. I think we could rein in, rein in our, our government uh, quickly, but, you know, that's cruel and unusual punishment, so that it would never fly, so forget I said that. But anyway, in this... In this time, uh, the laws that King Zeleucus handed down uh, were honored and uh, revered, and they lasted a long time. One of the laws had to do with adultery, uh, because one of, the, uh, one of the vices that they dealt with in their society, I know this is a shock, was marital infidelity and families being disrupted uh, and torn apart by this. So they passed a law that if you were caught in adultery, you would have your eyes burned out with a hot poker. Right, I'm, I'm ready to walk straight and narrow. <laughs> hey, let's go. So, the whole, um, so what happened was, though, uh, at some point after they passed that law, uh, a young man was caught in adultery, and it happened to be Zeleucus's son. Uh, his own son was brought in. And his advisors... Um, while he was awaiting uh, sentencing and, and, uh, and the execution of the sentence, uh, the administration of justice, his advisors urged him, you know, don't, you need to let, don't do this thing, you know, just re- change the law, right? And King Zeleucus understood, as many, as many ancient rulers have, you know, King Darius, he wanted to save Daniel from the lion's den, but he had put his stamp on there, right? And they, you know, he was, he, he didn't sleep all night. He's a, a, a heathen a king, stays up all night praying for Daniel, and then runs out at, at dawn at first light to see if he's still alive, right? So King Zeleucus is, is dealing with this, and he knows that if he just lets him off, I mean, this is his son, you know, uh, from his own flesh. And he loves his son very much. If he just lets him off, though, what does that say about the law? It's for, for thee and not for me. What does it say about the king? Well, he's willing to compromise. He's, he's, he's a stickler until it affects him. Right? He's above the law. Again, for you know, good for me, but not for thee. What does it say about to the son? who got caught in the act of adultery. All right, well, I got to pass. And so he's, he's agonizing over this decision, and so uh, he decided to move forward with the administration of justice, and they brought his son forward, and they had him bound and held. You know, you hold him down while I get the poker nice and hot, and they gouged out the first eye, they put the poker back in the, the fire, and the king said, wait, bring the poker over here, I want, and I want you to gouge out my eye. And he did. So the administration of justice was not carried out quite to the letter, not exactly to the letter, but it was carried out at great personal cost, and also with great mercy. 
So I want you to think for a minute. What did the people of the city think when they saw the king parading around in, in public with one eye? How did, they, how did they feel about him? Was he a, a good ruler? Was he a just man? Was he willing to uphold his law at great personal cost? Well, there's a sign right there. Every time they look at his face, they see his son walking around. And they see his son and they think, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not going to follow his example, but his, his father showed him mercy and was a good king, a good ruler, the kind of ruler that you would want to uh, reelect, uh, the kind that you would want to follow. And so the law was upheld in its integrity and its importance before the people. It endeared the king to the people. To see an act of mercy extended at such a price had to have an impact on the people. I mean, think about, you know, think about what you would, would, how you would feel. The love that would well up in your heart and the admiration that would well up in your heart for somebody who was capable of that kind of... And think about the wisdom as, he, as he's agonizing over what to do and how to deal with the situation. Think about the wisdom that was at play. And I think in this secular, obscure, secular king, in this little Greek uh, city-state, we have a picture, a little bit of a picture of what happened at Calvary. And God, you know, was God surprised by the wickedness of man? I uh, I think God, at the very least... God knew or believed that man was going to go astray. As to what your views are on absolute foreknowledge, um, I tend to think that uh, sometimes we surprise God in the depths of our... Because you know, in certain places in the prophets, uh, it actually says that they cause their sons and daughters to pass through the fire under Molech. They sacrifice their own children and burn them. Something that did not come into my mind says the Lord, that I did not command to, uh, that I did not command them to do, nor even, I, I did not command or mention, neither did it even come into my mind. And so I get the impression from Scripture, from just the plain presentation of, of God's horror at some of the things that his children have done, that uh, God knew we were going to sin one way or another. We can at least agree on that. And he made a provision Before any of you were born, before any of the disciples were born, before any of the patriarchs and prophets were born, Christ was slain from the foundation of the world. And God had made a provision. And as we read before, God was so ahead of the game and playing by a different set of rules. Had the devil known what was up, he wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. Some 4D chess going on. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would even dare to die. Right? I mean, would you take a bullet for somebody who was a lowlife, total scoundrel, a waste of flesh, Using speaking in human terms? Would you take a bullet for somebody who uh, had a reputation like that? But God shows or demonstrates his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. There's no quid pro quo here. God extends the atonement to every human being and says, I would love to redeem your life and bring you back into fellowship And call you my friend. And now because of the atonement that we have accomplished on the cross. 
in Jesus laying down his life. No man took Jesus' life. He laid it down freely. I mean, yes, they killed him, but it was part of his design. He laid his life down willingly. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to Jesus to listen to him, and both the Pharisees and the scribes began to complain, saying, This man received sinners and eats with them. And he told them this parable, saying, What man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the other ninety-nine in the open pasture to go after the one that is lost until he finds it? That's you and me. And when he has found it, he puts it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found my sheep that was lost. I tell you that in the same way there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner that repents than over 99 righteous people who have no need of repentance. Or what woman, if she has ten silver coins and loses one, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? I know all of us have done that at one point or another for a lottery ticket or a, a coin or a receipt or your, your Bitcoin wallet uh, keys. You know. All of us have, have been there. And she, she finds it, and she calls together her neighbors and friends, says, Rejoice with me, because I have found the coin which I had lost. There is no metaphor that captures the fullness of the atonement. There's simply too much going on here in the atonement. There is no... It's like trying to explain the Trinity to someone. What analogy... Do, well, it's like a triangle, you know. It's, there's a point, you've got Father, you've got Son, you've got Holy Spirit. That doesn't really capture the depth and... You know, and even like the kingdom of God, Jesus said the kingdom of God is like a man who found a treasure in a field. You know, the kingdom of God is like a, a, a woman who, you know, had 10 silver coins that over and over and over the kingdom of God is like. It's because every one of those metaphors just conveys a truth, an aspect of the kingdom of God. And likewise, there is no single metaphor, despite us sometimes trying to shoehorn the atonement into a metaphor. There is no one metaphor that captures the fullness of meaning of what God has accomplished and the depths and riches and, and wisdom that's in there. One of the ones that really gets me, and I like to, I used to like to troll people with this all the time. I would go, uh, like, uh, some, I'd go like to a, a discussion forum and I would, I would post, uh, you know, Jesus didn't pay for sin and just leave it there and then come back uh, and start responding to the comments just to see what people said the next day. Because I think that analogy is overused. Um, too many, too much of the church has made the atonement a literal payment, like a transaction for sin. Retributive justice. What is, what is retributive justice? That is uh, punishment for wrongdoing. Retributive justice is a flogging. It is a jail. It is an execution. Um, you know, it's, it's a, you know, an eye for an eye, basically. And I don't want to demean eye for an eye because when that law was given, it, it was really teaching that the same punishment for a rich man as for a poor man is what's prescribed in the law of God and that you're not to show favor, favoritism or leniency, but you enforce impartially the laws. So, anyway, but that, because there's, there's all these problems with pushing that payment too far. Um, some of the ones that I enjoy are, uh, if Jesus paid for sin, a literal payment, who got the payment? Who did he pay? Well, then the ransom theory of the atonement, which was a... a a dominant theory or a predominant theory for the first thousand years of the church, uh, it would be a payment to the devil to release you from captivity in some sense. Uh, you know, did God pay himself? I don't know. That, that doesn't seem to make much sense to me. Maybe, maybe it does to you. Uh, was the payment made to Jesus? 
No, because Jesus was flogged and crucified. He died a horrible, horrendous death. I mean, again, the analogy breaks down when you try to push it too far. What justice was satisfied at the atonement was not retributive justice. The punishment of the law was not carried out to the letter. What is the wages of sin? Death. Death. What kind of death? Death in hell forever, right? The wages of sin, all of us are going to have, you know, eternally separated from God in a place called hell where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, lots of people teach that Jesus went into Hades and, you know, took the keys to hell and death and for three days while he was in the tomb. But I don't know anybody that teaches that Jesus went to hell forever, <laughs> Right? Much less once, one forever for every person who's going to be saved. Some people argue, well, the sufferings of Christ are weightier and, you know, because it's God. And I'll, you know, I'll grant them that. I think, again, I think it's sometimes, some, you, you try to push these analogies past their breaking point, I think, in doing that. I believe that the justice that was satisfied at the cross was public justice, like we just talked about with Kings of Lucas. It was a demonstration, just like all of the sacrifices of the Old Testament were a, a foreshadowing, a picture of the sufferings of the Messiah. They were pointing to the coming Messiah, the, the ultimate sacrifice, the once and for all sacrifice. For Publicly and for all to see, Jesus was humiliated. He died the death of a common criminal in front of everybody. Nothing was hidden. It was all out in the open. And he, his form, his visage, his face was so marred that he didn't hardly, you couldn't hardly recognize him as a man. His back was in tatters from 39 lashes with the what, cat of nine tails, the you know, whip that had metal fragments in the leather. Uh, I don't, can't remember what the terminology is, but they would grip and, and rip with every lash. And he was flogged like that, 39 lashes, and then they crucified him, which was a horrendously painful death that I won't get into, maybe if I preach at Easter next year. Um, but... These things were done publicly, and what they showed was the horrendous weight of sin. All of our sins were cast and put upon Christ on the cross. He bore all of them, every sin that we've ever committed and every person that's gone before us. He took the weight of all that in a, in a picture to show all of the 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 sentient universe, what sin is, what sin looks like, the damage and the weight of sin. And I have no problem saying he paid an incredible price. But God was not the first convert under the ministry of Jesus Christ, God the Father. God has always been willing to forgive. God was full of mercy under the old covenant. And yes, his wrath burns against sin. But his wrath burns against sin today also. And he's long-suffering. That's why we're all still here. Somebody asks, you know, why doesn't God just, you know, fix, get rid of all the evil in the world if he's all-powerful? Well, the answer, is, the answer is simple. You may not like it, but all that God would have to do to get rid of all the evil in the world is just to annihilate every selfish and wicked person. Thanks, I'll let myself out. Whew. Okay. It's not necessarily the answer that they, uh, that they want. But no, God, was, God the Father was not changed. Jesus was offered as a propitiation, the Bible says. A propitiation is that which is offered to an offended or an aggrieved party to render them clement or forgiving and, or favorable. And Jesus was offered, I would, now here's where I put a dollar in the heresy jar. 
Just for the uh, people watching at home and the, for the recording sake. Okay. Um, I believe that that propitiation goes two ways. That Jesus was offered up as a propitiation toward God the Father to allow him to be lenient and forgiving to us. And Jesus was also offered the Bible we just read earlier for our glory to break our hearts. To turn our hearts toward God. To see the character of God in the administration of justice and mercy. What God went through willingly. Even the sacrifices of the Old Testament, the animals were not made to suffer unnecessarily. They slit their throat on the altar. Um, Jesus went even further than that. And some, some believe or teach that that is why there's healing in the atonement. That Jesus not only took our... Uh, our death upon himself, but that he also took our sicknesses and healed our diseases, that there's healing in the, in the atonement as well, accomplished through the gratuitous sufferings that he underwent. He, his sweat became as drops of blood in the garden. Um, he suffered immensely as the burden of our sins. He took it upon himself. So when we look at the atonement, I want you to see and I'm going to wrap up here. It's 11.37. I've gone a little long. because It's because my wife didn't stand up and do this. So, not my fault. Um, but I want, you to look at, I want you to look at the atonement of Christ. And I want you to see the absolute brilliance of God's wisdom. What he accomplished. So, it was so far, his ways are so far above our ways. And so far, even the devil didn't know what was going on. Couldn't, I mean... And he's a wily old fox. He's been around for a long time. And then I want you to think about your personal situation now. Wherever you are, whatever you're going through, no matter how overwhelmed you are right now with, uh, with your job, with worries over the economy, um, I hope that you guys are not as, uh, as glued to your social media feeds as, as I am, unfortunately, because it's, it's, like a, it's a total burden. Uh, what just reading news updates all the time. I realized uh, that um, you know I need to uh, I need to turn that off. And you know, Daily Audio Bible is a great podcast. Uh, the rest of them are uh, depressing. Um, but wherever you are and whatever whatever you're going through, I want you to remember that God is for you and not against you. God demonstrated His love for you. By dying for you when you were still wielding weapons of warfare against his throne. And believe me, there's only one king in the kingdom. There's only one throne in heaven. And uh, it's not yours. Even when you were in that state and mindset, Jesus died for you. How much more now that we're children of God adopted into his family. That he, he chastens us and disciplines us as sons. But he also loves and fellowships with us in a way that was not possible before the atonement of Christ. How much more is God's heart not inclined toward you right now? How much more does he not want to bless you and to deliver you, to hear your prayers, and to show himself partial on your behalf? God is often, and by default, an impartial God. He, sometimes we're like, you know, God, I wish you'd just do something. Well, he has. Okay, he has. But God is there as an impartial observer in many situations. He becomes partial when you step out in faith and pray. God becomes partial in your situation. And he shows you favor. And no matter what you've done or where you've been, the love of God pursues you. You are the lost coin you are the lost sheep. And no matter how you've been wronged, maybe your circumstances are not even your own doing, maybe your circumstances are not your fault, shall not the judge of all the earth do right. As Abraham talked with God, you just run out of superlatives at some point to, when you're describing the goodness and the love and the mercies of, of our Creator. Do not worry. There's a lot of uncertainty today. There's lots of things to be concerned about. But God knows what you need before it's even on your tongue. 
Just remember the goodness of God as you go about this week, as you pray, as you minister to others. Um, Eye has not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you. Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. Lord, thank you for the coming week. We thank you that, Lord, you preserve us in the midst of every storm and that your love toward us is abundance, is abundant, Lord God, that the things you've planned for us are beyond even our imagination. And we often believe you for too little. And I just pray that you would, um, you know, our congregation today, as we've dug into your word a little bit, that we'd be inspired to believe you for more. Um, to glorify your name, Lord, through our conversations and, uh, and, and all that we do in service to you and others. We thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.